Our sermon text for today is the gospel lesson for the fifth Sunday after Easter. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's gospel teaches both the necessity and the comfort of prayer, as well as the fruits of true faith. This is part of the same passage which we have been hearing for three weeks. The Christ gave this sermon to his disciples on the night of the Last Supper, in which he promised them the Holy Spirit and prepared them for his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Philip Melanchthon writes in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, All scripture ought to be distributed into these two topics, the law and the promises. Or, as we more commonly speak, the law and the gospel. Whenever scripture commands something that must be done, this is the preaching of the law. On the other hand, whenever scripture promises anything good for the sake of the Christ, this is the preaching of the gospel. And this division between the law and the gospel, as the apology teaches, is to be applied to all scripture. Very often, the same passage of scripture preaches the law to one audience and one circumstance, and to another circumstance, the same passage preaches the gospel. For this reason, it is necessary to rightly distinguish between the law and the gospel, as they are contained in all of scripture, so that we rightly apply the teachings of scripture to ourselves in every moment. The distinction between the law and the gospel, which the formula of Concord calls a brilliant light, we apply to today's gospel text. In it, we find that prayer is both commanded according to the law and contains special promises according to the gospel. The Christ says, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive. Ask, he says. This is the command. You do not have permission not to ask, because this flows from the first commandment, which commands that we look to God as the source of all good things. Now, there are two kinds of prayer. One in which we request something of God, and the other when we give thanks to God for something. Both of these are commanded and necessary. But today's gospel especially commands that we ask things of the Father. In the Lord's Prayer, we ask for things both spiritual and earthly. Spiritual things such as that God's name be hallowed among us, his kingdom come and his will be done. We ask for earthly things such as our daily bread and that we be delivered from the evil one. In this way, to ask something from God is a good work which pleases God on account of the commandment. It is also good on account of faith, because unless you believe in the one true God and believe that he is the ultimate source of all good, you will not pray. So prayer, and in particular, the prayer that asks for something, flows from a sincere faith. 
When we pray to God, asking him for those things which we want and which he has commanded us to ask for, we obey especially the second commandment, which tells us to honor the name of God by calling upon him in every need. In fact, the second commandment was given to compel us to pray. In our sinful condition, we neglect to pray and do not call upon God when and as often as we should. Therefore, the commandment was given so that we should be driven to prayer by the law, lest we fail to pray on account of our natural laziness. This is the preaching of the law as applied to prayer. The gospel, however, offers another motivation to pray by offering great and wonderful promises to those who pray in faith. These promises of our text are as follows. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Also, ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. And a third blessing is this. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me. Whereas the law drives us to pray through force and threats, the gospel urges us to pray by means of the great and comforting promises which it gives. Now, immediately when we hear the promise that we will receive whatever we ask in the Christ's name, our sinful flesh protests with everything for which we have prayed and which we did not receive. When this happens, first of all, silence your lying flesh with the words of our text. If the Son of God, by whom the world was created, promises that we will receive whatever we ask the Father in his name, then trust that you will receive it. As it is written in Romans 3, Let God be true, but every man a liar. After this, learn that there is a distinction between those general requests which we, ought to, which we are taught to pray in the Lord's Prayer and which pertain to the whole church, and those specific requests which pertain to just ourselves. God certainly promises to give us daily bread, to forgive our sins, and to deliver us from evil. We pray for these knowing that he will do them. But we do not always understand how he does them. In the case of the martyrs, delivering them from evil meant letting them die faithfully. In the case of Job, giving him his daily bread meant first taking everything away. Scripture explains in such cases that God remains in control and keeps his promises, even when it is not what we expect. In the end, God will do what he promises to do, even when that end is death. This helps explain why, in private trials, our requests may not seem to be granted us. It is not that the promise does not apply to private needs, it certainly does. But we do not always understand God's method of granting our requests. When, in private afflictions, we pray to God for anything, and that thing is withheld, 
that does not mean that God is a liar. What it means is that God knows what we need better than we do. And when we do not receive what we ask, faith trusts that whatever we do receive from God is good. For this reason, in private requests, it is appropriate to pray if it is the Lord's will. This is not a prayer of doubt when we pray thus. It is a confession. First, that God's will is good, and second, that he will give us what is good, even if we do not know what that is. The reason that God does not always seem to give us what we pray for is not because God is unfaithful, but because we are ignorant. In Matthew chapter 7, the Christ teaches, What man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now suppose that this son, in his childishness, asks for a serpent. Is the father unfaithful because he gives him a fish instead? No, because the child does not understand the danger in the serpent. In a similar way, we are ignorant children before God, and do not know whether what we ask for is good or not. We should not judge God unfaithful, because he understands better than us what is beneficial. Furthermore, this does not mean that we should not ask. Even if we are ignorant, whatever need we feel we should bring to the Father in faith, trusting his promise that whatever we ask in the name of the Christ, he will give us, even if he has an unexpected way of doing it. Such a prayer is pleasing to God, because it flows from a faith which expects all good things from God alone, in accordance with the first two commandments. Therefore, when we ask the Father for anything, and by the Holy Spirit possess such faith, this promise is also added, that the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me. If God loves you, that means that he is pleased with you, that he is not angry with you, and that he does not hold your sins against you. Prayer is effective for this reason, that God loves you and wants to give you good things. Therefore, he has given his son unto death for you, so that he might not judge you, but rather love you as he loves his only begotten son, who is the Christ. Faith is living and active through prayer, because one who believes in the Christ and believes that the Father truly loves him for the sake of the Christ, this one prays joyfully. Therefore, the fruit of faith and the fruit of prayer is joy. As the Christ says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. True joy does not come from earthly circumstances, but joy is the confidence that for the sake of the Christ, you have been reconciled with God, and that you now have a loving, heavenly Father, who desires to give you all good things, and does give you all good things. 
Because your joy is found in God, nothing in the world can take it away. This is how King Solomon describes the one thus reconciled to God. He will not dwell unduly on the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Likewise, Psalm 112. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Prayer has both a command and a promise. We are commanded to pray so that we do not neglect prayer according to the natural laziness of our flesh. At the same time, prayer is blessed with very great promises, which motivate our faith to pray often and eagerly. For God has promised to give us whatever we ask in the Christ's name. And the result of such prayer is joy. Joy in being reconciled and loved by God. A joy which cannot be taken away and which will endure to the end of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.